Good morning. My name is James, and I am one of the pastors here. So good to see you here this morning. This morning, we're going to talk about how community builds mission, and we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. You know, we live in an interesting time when it comes to people and relationships, especially with the emergence of technology and social media. You know, you see so many people communicating through these means now, right? So you can have a thousand friends online and never have to leave your house and interact with people that way. And we have people who are creating videos of their kids, opening up toys and making money off of that on YouTube. And then the newest one that I actually just discovered, I didn't realize this was a thing, is Instagram influencers. So we all know about Instagram, I think, but it's mostly just based off of pictures, right? But there are people now, I couldn't believe this when I, when I found out about it, that actually make money off of just going somewhere, taking a picture of themselves, doing something with a certain product, and a company pays them to be able to do that. And they're called influencers. So they've even made up a name for it. Um, so it's just, it's an amazing time to be alive. I'm not going to comment on whether that's a good thing or not. I'll let you decide that for yourself. But with all of the uh, advancement in technology and the advancement in social media and the connectedness online, we're still not any better than we were before, right? People are still lonely. People are still wandering. They're still looking for meaning and purpose in life, and they're looking for relationships. So no matter what era that we're in, we, we have two great needs in life. The first need is to be connected with other people in community and to have relationships with each other. And then I, I would say the second need is to live for something significant and meaningful in life and to have a purpose. And so no matter what time of, of history we live in, we have those two great needs. Well, the amazing thing is that God has created his church which can fulfill both of those needs. We can find community with others in Christ, and we can live out his mission and, and live a life of eternal significance. So the first point that I want to talk to you about this morning is that the love of Christ is about people. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. It says this, For the love of Christ controls us because we have con concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So the love of Christ is about people. Jesus came to live a sinless life and to die for us so that we would live for him. And if you put your faith in Jesus, you're no longer controlled by sin, but you're controlled by the love of Christ. So before Christ you didn't know any different. You were controlled by sin. But Jesus has shown us a better way. So the death he died, he died because of our sin. He died for us. So we now consider ourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ. Everything we do now is submitted to Christ to be used for his purposes. So Galatians 2.20 says it this way. It says, I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's no longer I who live. I need to become less like me and more like Jesus. Does anyone remember the slogan uh, from the 90s, what would Jesus do? Anybody remember that? I'm sure some of you had the, the bracelet and the t-shirt and the bumper sticker, and all the things that came with that, right? And that's a great thing. I think that was a great slogan. I don't know what happened to it, but we should remember it. It should be one that, that stays in our minds that we recall constantly. And that's really what this verse in Galatians is saying. It's saying, um, how would Jesus live out the life that you are living? What would Jesus do? So one has died for all, therefore all have died. Every person that you encounter is someone that Jesus shed his blood for. The gospel forces us to look at people differently because Christ died for them, so they have value. So we can't just dismiss them. We have to find a way to see what God sees in them. They have value because Jesus says that they do, and that needs to be enough for us. We can't just decide for ourselves the different people's value. We have to look for what Jesus has done to them 
and, and have the value that he has. So I want you to try this exercise. It's really interesting. Think of somebody in your life that you struggle with, that you, you have a hard time seeing this way, right? You have a hard time seeing that Jesus might have died for them. Think of that person, put their name in your head. Now, I'm going to use the, the name Tim. If your name's Tim, I'm really, really sorry. I didn't know that you were going to come this morning. Otherwise, I would have picked a different name. But I'm just going to use Tim as an example, okay? So Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while Tim was still weak, at the right time, Christ died for Tim. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while Tim was still a sinner, Christ died for Tim. I think when you put it in that context, it's a little bit harder for you to think uh, differently about that person. It's a little bit harder for you to hate or judge or think less of that person because you see them in the context that Christ sees them and it should change the way that you interact with them and the way you speak to them, the way you pray for them and the way you make choices about them. Jesus died for you, but he also died for the person that's different than you, for the person that you struggle to love. And what Jesus thinks about them is the most important thing. So as we, as we learn about the love of Christ controlling us, we're actually learning about what it looks like to love people the way Christ loves them. That's part of our growth as Christians. So living for Christ means loving who he loves. So let's be honest. We all struggle to love people the right way. We struggle because we're sinful. We struggle because they're sinful and because sin makes it hard to love people. But if the love of Christ controls us, we will learn to love who Christ loves. Look what it says in 1 John. God equates loving him with loving others. 1 John 4, 17 says this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So Christians aren't given the option of hating their brother, right? We're called to practically show the love of Jesus by loving our brother. So we can't say, you know, come in here on a Sunday and sing songs as if we love Jesus and then go out during the rest of the week and hate our brother and hate our neighbor, hate those around us. God's called us to love other people with his love. And the evidence that we follow Jesus is that we love others like we love God. So I've heard this quote said before by people, and you probably said it. I think I've even said it at some point. You know, the church would be such a great place if it weren't for people, right? You've probably heard that before. But here's the crazy thing. You're a person. So you're saying that about yourself. The church would be such a great place if it weren't for me. Um, you know, when we apply that personally, we realize that you're a person, you're hard to love. There have been many times, I'm, I'm sure, throughout your life that you've been a difficult person to love, and me as well. And so we have to look at ourselves and say, all right, what is the real problem? The real problem isn't people. The real problem is sin. So without people, there would be no church. There would be no mission. So people aren't the problem. Sin is the problem. So we need to fight sin, not people. I think that's hard to accept because it's much easier to just fight people and feel justified in that. But we need to realize the real battle that is, is on for sin and for people's souls. People are valuable and we need to love them. But people need a mission and they need something great to live for. So point number two this morning, without mission, community fails. Community wasn't just designed to exist for itself. The community needs a greater mission besides just the people that gather. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be at each other's throat and we'll be nitpicking and looking for all the different things that this person does right and this person does wrong and sin will just take over, right? But if we have a greater mission, if we have something greater to live for that God's called us to, we'll be focused on that mission and we'll be living that out. And 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 16 continues on. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. One big reason 
that Jesus came and died was to create for himself a people that would exist to know him and to make him known. A community that only exists for itself is not a community that represents Christ. It's just a self-preserving clique. And we've all seen cliques, right? We've probably even been a part of them before. So full disclosure, when I was in high school, it was not my favorite time of life. And this was mostly because I was skinny, I had zits, I had braces, and I sang in the choir. So all those things are, are not things that make you cool in high school, right? So I didn't fit into any of the cliques. They didn't want me to be a part of what they were doing because I wasn't cool like they were cool. And, and I don't have any bitterness. It's okay. It's okay. I'm fine. I turned out all right. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you've all been there. And, and I don't understand what it is about teenagers and high school and that whole phase of life. But for some reason, there's just this identity that comes with dressing a certain way and saying certain things and partying and whatever else might come with that. And I didn't really identify people that way. I just wanted to be people's friends and get to know them and, and, and know who they really were. But everybody wanted to put this front on, like you had to be a part of this thing or that thing. And I'm like, I don't care if they're a jock or they're a nerd or they're a cheerleader. I just want to know who they really are and get to know them and be their friend. So that whole season of life for me was really weird, and I couldn't wait to get through it because I think we all know that, that we, we outlive high school, and it becomes silly, and we look back on it and laugh. And I hope, I hope none of you are still trying to live in high school. It's not a good thing. You should really grow past that. Uh, <laughs> But the church is not supposed to be like that, right? We're not supposed to say, oh, you dress a certain way or you say a different thing or you look like this so you can be a part of us, right? We accept people because of Christ and because of the love of Christ. So the church is the visible representation of the body of Christ. It's imperfect, but it is God's plan to reach the world. And you need to trust God's plan. We need to stop trying to find our ultimate community in other people and other places. But God has designed his church as the place for you to find your primary community where you can grow to live out the mission, where you can grow to become like Jesus. We need to trust that God's plan can work, even when it seems impossible, even when it seems like the people that we're around, we don't think in our own minds that we could learn anything from them, or we don't think we have anything to offer them. God can use us in each other's life, and we need to trust that that's possible. So we don't need more community that's centered around making much of each other or our hobbies. But if the world is going to see Jesus, they need to see God's people gathering in community to make much of him. And God's people must look to God for their purpose. God hasn't left us without direction. He's given us a new identity. He's given us a new way to love. And he's given us a, a new mission. He redeemed us for a purpose. And that purpose is to advance the gospel. So at the center of every Christian community is the mission of Jesus. Community doesn't just exist for itself. It exists for God's mission. And God sets that priority, not the community itself. God is on a mission, and he's invited us into that mission. So before Jesus ascended to heaven, this is what he said to his church in Acts 1.8. He said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So God has called us to be his witnesses, right? No matter where we go, whether it's at home or whether it's in our neighborhood, our community, our workplace, um, in Virginia, in the U.S., and beyond, all around the world, we're to be his witnesses. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a witness? Well, it really just means to speak the truth of the gospel. So we speak it to ourselves, we speak it to each other in the church, we speak it outside of the church to those who need to hear it and be changed by it. We're called to be as witnesses with the life-changing truth of the gospel. So in order to do that, we need relationships, right? You can't, be, you can't be a witness to yourself. That doesn't make sense. Nobody would ever know. And you need a Bible, and you need to be able to speak the truth. Um, there must be others hearing what you're bearing witness to. So community becomes vital for that. And there are all kinds of different things that we can get caught up in in life. There's all kinds of missions that we could live for. There's all kinds of agendas that we could advance and be caught up in. 
But when Christians gather, what are they, what are they supposed to be doing? What are they called to do? Well, I love this quote from Kevin DeYoung. It's from a book that he wrote called The Mission of the Church. It says this, The mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit and gathering these disciples into churches that they might worship the Lord and obey his commands now and in eternity to the glory of God the Father. So I think that's pretty clear. And we see that multiple times in Scripture, right? We see it in Acts. We also see it at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, in the Great Commission. But the mission is about seeing Christ formed in others. So as we bear witness to the gospel in our own lives, it encourages other people to grow in Christ. So we want that for ourselves, and we want that for other people. We want the best for people. We want their good. And the greatest good that they could have is Christ in them, the hope of glory. Look what it says in Colossians 1, 27 through 28. And Paul says this, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So we want to grow and be mature in Christ. We also want to present others mature in Christ as well. It's not just about uh, getting together with other Christians and hanging out. It's not just about gaining Bible knowledge, but it's about taking that, in, internalizing that, and allowing it to transform you, and then being used in the lives of other people. It's about working towards growth in each other. So you should be able to look back years from now and say, wow, you know, I'm a different person today than I was three years ago. Because of the gospel, because of the investment that people have made in my life and the community that I put myself around, I'm becoming a different person. I'm becoming more like Jesus. It's very slow. It takes time, but it's sure. And this brings me to my, my final point, and it, it's this. You need to change the way that you look at people. I think we all struggle to look at people the way that Christ looks at them. But this verse really clarifies for us how we're supposed to do that. So let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. People don't exist for you. It's easy to view people as a means to an end, to just use them to get what you want. I think that's what most of the world does, right, that we see around us. But look what he says right here. He says, we regard no one according to the flesh. What, is it, what does it look like to regard someone according to the flesh? Well, it means we see them for just what they are, flesh and bone. We see them from our initial impressions. We don't get to know them. We don't see the soul that's within them. We don't see the potential that God has for them. We must see people the way Christ sees them. They matter to God, and they must matter to you. And we need to see them as souls that Jesus wants to save. In the book, uh, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, Paul Tripp has this to say. He says, people do not belong to us. They belong to God. Relationships are not primarily for our fulfillment. On the contrary, relationships between sinners are messy and difficult, labor-intensive and demanding. But in that, they are designed to result in God's glory and our good as he is worshiped and our hearts are changed. This quote really represents a very different way of viewing people and relationships. Because I think if we're honest, most of us view them for what we want, right? We we gravitate towards people who will make much of us, who will make us feel better about ourselves, and who will like what we like. That's not always a bad thing. God can use that. But I think ultimately, we have to view people as a way that we worship God, a way that we grow together in Christ and become his body. It's, it's completely impossible to do unless the love of Christ controls you. We need more and more of that. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says this, 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So this, this verse should challenge you because the world has trained us to do the opposite of that, right? To push everyone down, to, to exalt ourselves, to prove that we're better than everyone else, and everyone else can get behind us. But if you are a Christian, you're a new creation. God gives you the ability to lift other people up and to help them find their fulfillment in Christ. So in order for the mission to advance, each of us will have to change our thinking from an individualistic mentality to a team mentality. We have to work together to accomplish the mission, so we need to learn how to love each other and, and help each other have value in Christ. So when we first planted this church, uh, when me, and, me, Nate, and Steve met in seminary, we, we were working together at Liberty, and we were in seminary together there, and we met at a, at a men's Bible study at Steve's house. And I think in the beginning, it was really interesting because if you've met any of us and spent any time with us, we're very, very different people. We, we have different personalities. We have different likes. We have different uh, giftings and abilities. And so in the early years, it was a struggle at some points because we had to figure out how we're going to work out those differences and work together so that the church can advance, right? And I think if we're committed to the mission and if Jesus is our highest goal, if we love him above all else, we can work through a lot of different personal issues that we have and a lot of personality quirks that exist because we want to see him lifted up. We want to see the mission go forward. And so we're going to have to get out of our own way and learn to work with other people. We have to see that their contribution is just as valuable as our contribution. And we have to be able to put our differences aside and and love each other for the sake of Christ. So if we can do it, I know that you can do it as a church. And it's amazing to see what God has done over the years just in our relationship together and and, and loving each other and loving Christ and using us to to grow his church. So God created you to help others and to be helped by others. Because of the fall, none of us can say that we don't need help. Right, so, so you can say, well, those people get together for community group or discipleship group or whatever. That's cool. You know, that's cool that they like to hang out and, and have friends in the church, but that's not really for me. You know, I, I don't really need that. I'm doing pretty good. I, I read my Bible every day, and I, I feel like I'm, I'm checking, you know, I'm get, getting through Leviticus, and it's been great, and I'm just really, you know, growing a ton, and I just don't really need people. You know, I've, I've got it covered. That's not true. I mean, the Bible tells us it's not true. We, we all need help because sin has messed everything up. It's messed us up. And so we can't really get anywhere if we're not willing to, to submit ourselves to each other in community. We need help from other people, and other people need help from you. And to say otherwise is to live in denial. So without other people, you're not going to make it, right? You need them, and, and they need you. Uh, people are going to hurt your feelings. They're going to be inconsiderate and they're going to be insensitive and uncaring. Um, And you're not doing it because they treat you right, right? Because of sin, they're going to treat you wrong at some point. It's going to happen. You're doing it because the love of Christ controls you and he has called you to do it. And so that ultimately has to be our motivation for that. Uh, Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 15. Paul says, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. I think that's just an amazing verse because I think we all have times in our life when we're weak. We have times when we're idle. We, We have times when we need people to be patient with us, right? And so, that's the same thing for other people. They have that, that need as well. So we have to remember that as we, as we go through seasons where it's a struggle to love them, where it's a struggle and it's a fight to be in that relationship. God gets glory from other people becoming like Jesus. When you live your life for Jesus, it brings him glory to make disciples and to participate in their growth. There's so many things that you could live your life for 
and be dedicated to. But only one thing will go beyond this life, and that's the investment that you make in helping others grow in their relationship with Jesus. So I get the privilege of sitting down with people in this church and doing membership interviews. And I get to hear the stories of, of how God is changing them through the people in this church. And it's, it's really a privilege to be able to, to hear those stories. Uh, there was one young lady that shared with me that she did not grow up in a Christian home. Uh, she was in school to become a physical therapist. And while she was there, she met a fellow student who, who went to Village as well. And this student invited her uh, to become a part of her discipleship group and to study the Bible with a couple other girls. And so she, she joined up with them and started hanging out with them and reading the Bible. And she, she told me, she said, you know, it, it was incredible to see these ladies, um, just the love that they have for Jesus and the love that they had for me. And I had never seen an authentic faith like that on display. I'd never seen uh, people that, that took their faith serious and, and it, they actually believed it and they were trying to live it. And so over, over time, she started to come in you know, from a discipleship group to services. And over time, she accepted Jesus as her savior, was baptized in this church, and now she's a member and she serves and follows Jesus every every week here. So um, that's what it looks like. It looks like inviting people in to be a part of God's kingdom and being his witnesses to them. Uh, this, this final verse I want to share with you is in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, and I think it's just a great vision for us. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. There's just, there's so much meat in this verse. There's just so much to get out of it. But it's just clear that, you know, we're, we're calling people out of, of, of a pointless existence into value, right? Into being, being valuable to God because Jesus shed his blood for them. And, and then we're building the church, right? By, by being witnesses to the gospel in their lives. We're being joined together. We're being built together for a dwelling place for God. I think that's just an amazing vision that we should keep in front of us and remember constantly. So what does this practically look like? Well, it's not perfect. Nothing in this life is perfect, right? But we have a, an environment here called community groups. And what we do in these community groups, they meet in homes all around Chesterfield County and beyond. And what we do is we gather around the word and we, we talk about our own lives and we talk about how that's impacting us, and, and, and we're honest with each other. We pray for each other, and we encourage each other, and we, we keep up to date with each other's lives, right? And we eat food together, and, and we, we look for ways to serve our community, and we look for ways to advance the mission together. But it won't work if we don't believe that Jesus can actually use us in each other's lives, right? So we've got to trust that that's the way to go. The goal of community groups is to build relationships founded on the gospel so that we can live out the mission of Jesus. So if you're looking for a community group, I would love the chance to talk to you. I'll be out in the foyer afterwards. And also, we have something called Starting Point that we've been doing every year for about two years now. It starts uh, this August, August 21st. It's on Wednesday nights uh, here at the building. And we take six weeks and we just talk about what does it look like to be in community in this church. And then at the end of that six weeks, that group or that class launches into different groups uh, throughout the area into homes. And so if you're still looking for a group, if you'd like to be a part of one, I think that's a great place to start. That's why it's called Starting Point. Uh, so August 21st, um, if you're looking for a group, I'd love to see you out at that. Um, just a little shameless plug for community groups and for Starting Point, because I think it, it wouldn't be good if I gave you a vision for how community lives out mission and that I didn't tell you exactly what that looks like here at Village, right? Well, every week um, we take communion and, and we reflect on the uh, death of Jesus. The bread represents the body and the cup represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. 
So as we take communion, we remember his death, we remember his life, and we remember his resurrection. Take some time to reflect on your own life. Take some time to reflect on how you see people, how you see relationships. Consider whether you need to repent of some some wrong thinking and take some time to, to think about whether you need to be corrected by the word of God in your life. When you're ready, come. Mm-hmm.